What's up guys? Today on New CD Space, we are telling stories. What's up guys? Welcome back to OCD Space, your place for all things OCD. And I am Mike Parker at the Center for OCD and Anxiety in Pittsburgh, PA. And today we're gonna to be talking about storytelling, a critical element of OCD. Now, why is storytelling so important to OCD? Because obsessions are basically stories, right? If, if you just had a thought, right, related to your obsession at some point, a what if, right? If you just had a thought like, oh, what if, God rejects me, or what if I'm not in the right relationship, or what if there are uh, germs on the um, seat on the bus? Um, that wouldn't necessarily be enough, right? Um, that's not going to turn into an obsession. The reason why a what if becomes an obsession is because a story develops there. And that story has a lot of elements. For the uh, I'd say the first part of the story is just you feeling vulnerable to something. And so you feel particularly vulnerable to, um, you know, maybe losing control or being impulsive or doing something bad um, or being rejectable, whatever it might be. There's a, there's a baseline kind of story you have about yourself. And that goes probably way back, right? When, when you were thinking your way through life in, at, at, you know, as a child, possibly. Um, but, you know, in any case, there's uh, a story you have about yourself. Um, and then there's the story that you develop um, about your obsession, the, the specific stories that develop over time, over weeks, months, years, the story that developed this morning on this particular bus or with this particular person. Um, so there's always a story construction going on that leads to obsessions. And that is the part that makes things so believable, right? And so, um, you know, let's just say, uh, you know, you had a hit and run obsession. There's a story you have about like why when you get to work, um, you might have hit somebody. Right, you put together a whole story in your mind, and you're thinking to yourself, "Well, you know, my memory is not the greatest. I remember that one time. I couldn't even remember this." And then you, you know, sometimes I do kind of zone out. I remember my wife uh, had to say something to me twice the other day because I was so zoned out. Um, I didn't even notice her talking, and you know, so maybe that happened while I was driving, right? And so you put together stories. And so what does that mean? That means to actually get through this, to actually recover from this obsession, to get over this, um, that story has to be addressed. Now with OCD, we're always looking at how is imagination, how is the imagination and reality getting blurred? Because that is a huge characteristic of OCD, a vivid imagination, uh, a tendency to go into your imagination, and then to get confused between the story that is unfolding in your imagination and the reality that you could actually just sense uh, with your senses um, if you were able to focus on it, right? And so there's a blurring between like that story and, and what's happening in reality. And uh, so to deconstruct an OCD story, we have to look at all the ways that that story was built in your imagination without a lot of sensory data to back it up. Um, and, and ultimately we're looking at how come you don't trust the sensory data you have available, right? When the, um, when the biopsy results come back from the doctor and say, negative, no cancer, um, how come that isn't enough? How come that becomes doubted? Why do you suddenly ask yourself if the tech did the test right and if the doctors read the results right and if the different biopsy results could have been mixed up between patients? Um, how come that information gets doubted, right? Because that's what's happening. The sensory information gets doubted, the sensory information gets rejected, um, you know, and, and it isn't trusted. And then what is trusted is that story. That story becomes so real to you that it supersedes any evidence against it. 
anything that you can pick up in the world that would be against that story gets dismissed, doubted, rejected. Now, um, now that I've sort of explained the importance of stories, I'm gonna throw out a little bit of uh, an exercise, you could say. So one thing to try <clears throat> when you get the chance is telling yourself an alternate story. And so to do this uh, effectively, what you wanna try and do is tell yourself an alternate story if your senses could be trusted, if the information you have available was enough, if the information you've received, you could believe it. What would be kind of an alternate version of this story? So, you know, when you go on the bus and you're worried that it's contaminated and you're thinking about the existence of germs and you're thinking about all the uh, people that could have been in that seat before you, um, what if you could trust the fact that you don't see anything? Um, nothing is noticeable, nothing is visible. Nobody has told you there's contamination. Nobody has uh, informed you not to sit on this seat. There is absolutely no information that is directly pointing to uh, the surface you are coming into contact with being dangerous. There's a lack of information but that lack of information is still information. There, you have received no information that you are in danger. What if that could be trusted? What if the available information could be trusted and you could go about your life living that way? Because let's face it, your senses, they're not perfect, right? And you'll never have perfect information and you'll never have all the information, but it's all you do have right? Your senses are all you have. The available information is all you have. And you've got to make judgment calls. You've got to make, draw conclusions and inferences and decide how to live your life based on the available information. And that requires trust. You got to trust what you've been told. You got to trust what you've seen. You got to trust the information you have in reality. And you can't fill in all the gaps with scary stories all the time. Now this, guys, is not a cure for OCD. That is not the goal here. It's not like, oh yeah, I just told myself an alternate story and I found out my obsession is completely false and this alternate story is so much more realistic. No, <laughs> that's not gonna happen. Uh, the goal here is simply to understand that it is a story. The obsession is a story and it's one possible story. To you right now, it's like very believable, obviously, if you're living your life according to it, but it is still one story. And there are other possible stories out there. So just try that. Try telling yourself an alternate story from time to time. See how that feels. Um, it's not gonna replace your OCD story because you've been rehearsing that OCD story hundreds, thousands of times, over and over and over again. When I meet a client in therapy um, and we talk about their obsession, I get a story. You know, I get a lot of reasons why I should worry about this, a lot of justifications. And then, you know what? I get those same justifications, that same story, over and over and over again. Almost like rote, right? Like, um, like a habit, like as soon as the obsession comes up, I get this story, I get all the reasons. They, I don't even ask for them, I get them, right? And so, you know, that's how OCD works. You are constantly reviewing that story and rehearsing it and, and saying it to yourself and maybe even saying it to others. And so that story is not gonna change overnight. You've been telling it to yourself a long time. But starting to tell yourself alternate stories can start to soften that, right? And then eventually you're gonna to get to the point where you've rehearsed other possibilities just as much as the OCD story. And that's, you know, when you start to see, I don't have to live my life according to this one what if anymore. All right, guys, well, I hope this has been helpful. Um, until next time, take care and trust yourselves.